So uh, what uh, I'd like to do is uh, talk to you about um, uh, doing quantum optics with uh, Rydberg um, atoms, particularly with Rydberg blockade. So basically my plan is to uh, first give kind of a broad introduction uh, to tell you why um, uh, we are doing what we are doing, and also then give some background. So in particular, uh, I will talk um, about um, topics like Rydberg blockade, electromagnetically induced transparency on classical light. And then uh, basically the key focus of these lectures, which I think I'll uh, probably come to only tomorrow, is this kind of new generation of experiments um, involving uh, doing nonlinear optics with single bottom in, in the quantum domain. Uh, which is mediated by strongly interacting atoms, in particular by Rydberg atoms. So I'll talk about photon blockade, photon bound states, and more. So if things go well, then I have a special bonus uh, section of my talk. So possibly tomorrow in the last lecture, I will also uh, tell you about kind of a new generation of experiments, uh, in which a very different system uh, is used, in which basically we use uh, sub-wavelength localization of light to do quantum nonlinear optics. And while seemingly different, what you will see is that there are very, a lot of parallels between this, this kind of the physics of these two subjects. And this is a little bit echoes what you just heard from Charles. So uh, uh, by kind of my informal pool during the breakfast today indicated that uh, you guys would uh, like to have less formulas and you'd like to ask more questions. So what I'll do to encourage that is I'll pause at times to, you know, to ask you for questions. And if I don't hear questions, I'll ask questions to the audience. Uh, in order to facilitate that, um, there is a, one other thing which I'd like to cover. And this will be uh, what I'll call five things that you must know about quantum optics and atomic physics. Uh, if you leave the school without knowing that, then uh, you'll have to reimburse National Science Foundation for the costs of your lectures. <laughs> so uh, I must say that <laughs> this is uh, the kind of things that I almost kind of know my kind of school and summer schools and winter school talks. I actually, you know, talk about these fi five uh, things. And actually the very first time I've done it was um, here, I mean, two years, three years ago where basically, you know, I sort of, you know, completely on the fly wrote my lectures and added these five things. And so I will see, you know, how it goes this time. Uh, okay, so but basically, uh, just to, to give you a big picture, so the, um, this work is part uh, of the kind of logic quest for what we call controlling quantum world. So in this um, uh, quest, what we're trying to do is isolate and control some simple quantum objects, individual, atoms, ions, photons, and then start building uh, more and more complex systems from there. And you know, in some way, this kind of quest really pushes the technology to ultimate limits. For example, conventional techniques like magnetic resonance imaging are now being extended all the way to basically do this, you know, Im Im you know images on uh, at the level of single uh, uh, molecules, you know, say single nucleus. Uh, likewise. Uh, Nonlinear optics is by now a very well established discipline with a lot of scientific and technological applications. But uh, for, uh, for a long time, um, uh, one you know, question, uh, so the holy grail of this field was to, to, to extend this technique to a domain involving single photons interacting with each other. So this is, you know, what you see is a big part of what we are, we are doing. So what we hope to do with this kind of systems is uh, explore new physics, for example, for search for new states of matter, and also maybe explore some new applications, for example, applications to quantum information science. So basically just to kind of once again, in a very, kind of very broad level, give you a little bit um, of a feeling of what one needs to really do to gain the control of a quantum world, we could just look at the example of building a quantum computer. And so in principle, you know, you can just now open a textbook and kind of look inside and, you know, it tells you how to do it, you know, but you know that it is extremely challenging. So what do you need? So first of all, you need to isolate uh, quantum systems uh, and basically, you know, for example, 
two-level systems such as quantum bits, you need to really be able to isolate it in order to preserve quantum <coughs> information uh, inside them. But then once you've done it, you of course need to, so what this means is that basically the interactions of these qubits with the surrounding world and these other qubits should be completely controlled, right? So it means that all systems should be really under kind of complete control. <coughs> but then once you've done it, what you, the only thing that you need to do is then just scale this system up, just keep adding these qubits and uh, you need to provide some kind of means to connect these qubits by some kind of quantum wires. And so, <coughs> so basically at the end of the day, you know, once you can do all of these things, you can just build an arbitrary quantum system, quantum computer, quantum simulator, whatever you wish. But this is of course very challenging and basically the really uh, key challenge is that you need to achieve simultaneous, very simultaneous, very good isolation and also control these connections and these connections over what amounts to a many body system. So this is really kind of a completely new territory, I mean, that no one has uh, gone to, but, you know, people are trying now for uh, over the last maybe two decades or so. So, uh, in particular, this uh, series of lectures will focus on developing these quantum wires. And basically what these quantum wires uh, means is that these are really techniques which allows uh, one to, you know, for example, couple distant qubits together and transfer quantum information between them. And so uh, the best way to do it is actually optical photons. So optical photons can carry quantum information for long distances uh, because they interact very weakly uh, with uh, uh, surrounding environment and because they are fast. So, and this uh, kind of gave rise early on to these ideas of basically this kind of hybrid systems where you uh, can store information in atoms and then use photons to move this information around. And this basically gave rise to a very uh, uh, kind of flourishing effort, broad effort in the AMO community, uh, where these kind of uh, ideas are explored now in a very wide variety of, of, uh, of, of uh, different kinds of quantum systems. And the big goal is to really build this kind of, you know, quantum networks or quantum internet, as, as, as some people say, where well, basically you use this kind of photonic quantum wires to transmit quantum states and you uh, and those connect some kind of nodes um, where you can process, uh, store and process this information. And this kind of networks may range from just, you know, having a little network on a chip, you know, all the way to kind of continental or intercontinental scale. And the key thing that you need to do is basically you need to move information between uh, these kind of carriers, between <coughs> photons and the memory, for example, atoms. And then you need to perform quantum logic. Uh, so in order to build a quantum computation, you also, for example, have to make you know, uh, uh, different qubits interact between each other. And so, for example, uh, you know, in the case if we use uh, Photons to move the information will also need somehow to facilitate uh, some kind of quantum logic between the information carriers, uh, namely photons. And that uh, kind of brings us to one of the challenges in this field, and this is the challenge of making uh, photons interact with each other very strongly. So, this is a long standing goal in optical physics. So, it's uh, kind of, a, as I mentioned already, it's a kind of a holy grail of nonlinear optics and ultimate limit of nonlinear optics, and there are many potential applications, uh, certainly in quantum information processing, but even in classical information processing. So if you can make uh, this kind of you know, devices where you basically can switch the propagation of the photon beam uh, by one or maybe even few photons, you can turn the switch on and off, you can actually do both classical and quantum logic in the optical domain, and this potentially uh, might have a you know, very, very powerful um, uh, impact uh, on, on technologies. So these are kind of examples. So for example, if you can build this kind of you know, single photon switches or transistors where one photon can turn basically a switch on and on and control the propagation of subsequent photons, or if you can process uh, information classical or quantum or optically, this you know, is, uh, would, would have a lot of um, potential applications. But this is very challenging. The reason is that basically the photons interact very weakly with each other and also uh, it's kind of 
relatively easy to lose a photon, namely to scatter the photon from one mode where it's guided and it's under control to some other modes. And so as a result, you know, uh, basically, you know, single optical photons uh, are not, uh, at, at present, uh, cannot be controlled quite to the same degree as, for example, single atoms or ions. So this is a problem that we would like to address. Okay, so now let's kind of, so this was sort of a motivation, uh, uh, a kind of broad introduction. So I'd like to now uh, come to sort of the meat of this lecture. So basically to really address this question, <coughs> we uh, need to uh, uh, deal uh, with the coherent interactions between different systems. Uh, and of course, in reality, what we need to take into account is that uh, none of the systems is perfectly isolated uh, from the real world. So we uh, basically, we need to now consider you know, the situations where we basically have different systems interacting with each other, uh, quantum mechanically and coherently, but at the same time, uh, those systems also are coupled to external environments. And so, uh, in what follows, I will kind of give you a little bit of kind of insights, you know, how to think about the systems. And actually, uh, if you would like to kind of more, uh, to see more details, so you should have a look in my lecture notes. So basically, this, some of these things which I'll tell you about will be kind of a condensed version of some uh, of the class that I'm uh, teaching at Harvard, and you can actually uh, read uh, uh, about that in, in this lecture notes at this website. Okay, so we would like to talk about open quantum systems. So what this means is that we have the kind of you know, relatively isolated system. Uh, in general, for the present lecture, it will be system composed of you know, maybe some few atoms or photons. And uh, the system would, in general, you know, couple to some surrounding environment. Right? So this coupling between system and environment uh, can be, for example, described by some kind of generic Hamiltonian of this of this time, where S is system operator, E is environment operator, uh, and you know, basically this kind of Hamiltonian, uh, if you let it just a you know, wolf, uh, uh, what it does, it basically entangles the system degrees of freedom with environment degrees of freedom. And this is how you know, quantum system loses its quantum character. So, for example, this interaction uh, makes you know, pure states evolve into the mixed states. So for this reason, in general, if you want to quantify the state of the system, you really have to use density matrix rather than, for example, uh, wave function. And basically, you know, the types of problems that we are kind of uh, dealing with, usually in this kind of field of quantum information, is that is that we now have this kind of system and environment interaction, and we of course try to minimize it somehow, but you know, there is a limited amount of uh, things that you can do. But afterwards, what you are, will try to do is basically try to apply some kind of control to the system and also maybe to the environment to try to really kind of massage these uh, you know, two things to really try to, for example, decouple them, right? To, in order to preserve, for example, a pure character of this thing. In addition, what you can do, you can apply a perturbation to the system, you know, which uh, might be some kind of useful perturbation because maybe you want this system to interact with some other system. And basically, the, the task is, is to minimize unwanted interaction with environment while kind of maximizing the coherent interactions. Right? So these are the kinds of questions that we'd like to, to ask in general. One is, can we preserve system's quantum state somehow for a long time? So this is a question of quantum memory. Can we make a quantum memory which lasts forever? So I'm actually not going to address it very much in my talk today, but you know, this is you know, one of the big questions in the field. Another one, which we, I, will actually, I will actually address is, can we couple, control, measure, couple this uh, system to other systems while basically simultaneously decoupling it from environment? So, okay, so these are the kinds of, you know, once again, in a broad uh, kind of uh, scale, these are what are this, what is this research is about. That's what sort of, uh, that's the fundamental questions which we are trying to address. Okay, so now let me, you know, after this kind of 
almost philosophical introduction, let's uh, go back to business. And you know, there are five things, as I said, that you have to uh, learn in this school. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. if you cannot learn uh, those, then you are not allowed to leave from this gated uh, area. You know. So uh, let's now, before I kind of you know impose my will on you, let's maybe I would like to kind of pause here and, and ask you what do you think these five things are. What are the most important thi important things in this in this business? And now to give you a little bit of a direction. So okay, the direction which I'm going to go is the following. So basically, if you kind of saw senior sci scientists interact with each other and discuss some kind of physics problems, you see that very seldomly that they sort of start writing complicated equations, right? So usually, uh, what people like to do is to talk in terms of some kind of physical pictures, right? So what this physical picture is, is, is some kind of like, also what's, what sometimes people call intuition, is some kind of simple models where you basically using these kind of simple models and simple principle often can sort of take apart some very complicated problem, right? And basically guess the answer to this very complicated problem before you start doing have complicated calculations or building kind of a challenging multi-year experiment. So what are the most important things? Okay, that's, you know, that's, that's okay, pretty. Trying. Well, okay, so let's, before, so, okay, let's, you know, <laughs> so, 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 so radio oscillations, so this was a good kind of, you know, beginning, but let me sort of, so it is indeed radio stations is an important uh, physical phenomena, and you know these radio stations occur usually for a two-level system, right? So two-level system, which is for example given by the uh, <coughs> external uh, uh, resonant field. So let's call this two-level system some state zero one. If you, for example, apply resonant field, it will undergo radio oscillations, right? Uh, but, you know, in general, of course, you know, so that's the simplest example, right? So in general, uh, you know, if you want to manipulate this two-level system, you sometimes would like to kind of go away from this simple radio oscillation picture. For example, you know, a lot of this research about this decoupling of system from environment involves this kind of applying these complicated pulse sequences, right? These pulse sequences which involve many, many pulses, right? And so... Uh, one of the things, you know, when you deal with two-level systems, which is very useful for uh, to understand that, uh, has a special, is a kind of like, is a special representation of two-level system techniques, right? So basically, okay, let me just mm -hmm. be more, a bit more specific. If I have two, a two-level system, I have some kind of complicated driving, you know, pulse sequence. What kind of physical picture uh, can you use to predict the answer without sort of solving equations in some very complicated way? Block sphere? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So block sphere for two-level system, if you have a two-level system given uh, in some kind of funky way, so what you, what you do usually you don't write down these equations for wave functions or even density metrics to solve it, but you use the fact that basically this two-level system is, is formally analogous to kind of spin, which is placed in an external magnetic field, which can be you know, time-dependent. Basically, you can pre represent this uh, spin dynamics on something which is called log sphere. So this will be the first thing that we need to know. Um, so let me just, before I explain, so how many people uh, here have heard about that? So, is there anyone who has never heard about box? Okay, so that's already a good beginning. So, but basically, let me just, now let's do that. So, um, so the blocks here, essentially, what you do, you represent the evolution of this, you know, of the system, that which can be into space, zero to one. You represent it uh, uh, by a kind of a block vector, uh, which uh, basically um, uh, 
uh, you associate, for example, a state zero with the block vector pointing up, uh, state one with the block uh, vector pointing down, but then basically what you can say is that, for example, if you have a pure state, then this you know, C1 and C0 you can represent as something like sine uh, cosine theta over 2, here, theta over 2 plus pi. So basically, in the case when this is a pure state, there are two angles which can specify this wave function. And these two angles are essentially the two angles which, uh, which basically characterize the direction of this so called block vector. So this block vector you know, is essentially kind of a spin representation of two level dynamics. Right? So if the system is in a lower state, the spin points in another direction. If the system is in an upper state, the spin points in another direction. If it's a superposition, it's somewhere in between. Right? So everyone knows that. Right? Right? So why is this cosine theta over 2? Why is it not cosine theta? Or did I make a mistake? Why? Because the direction. Because what? Direction. So there will be a So the cosine goes from minus one to one over theta. Or theta. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So basically what you'd like to do, so so this theta now goes, you know, here from zero to two to, to pi. Right, and basically you need to make sure that this, you know, spin up is uh, corresponds to one state, so to state zero. Right, now when you go down, you know, it should be the change, it should be stable. So it should be Okay, so, okay, these blocks here is something simple, and uh, everyone knows that, but what we will deal in with this lecture? Uh, is the systems which have more than two states. And it's a little bit of a problem, right? Because basically once you have more than two states, there is no real simple representation similar to a block sphere. So if you like to think about kind of driven <coughs> multi-state systems, what, uh, what is the most useful concept uh, that you can think about to think physically about these types of interactions, the atom field interactions. Well, okay. So the problem with you know optical block equations, of course, something that you can you know always write down and solve. But you know, once in particular, if you go to a system which has more than two states, three, four, five. Uh, or maybe a realistic system, solving this is not fun. So, and, uh, but if there is some kind of method which allows you often to guess the solution before you end up solving this block equation. Or there is a concept. So this concept is, uh, uh, is something which is called Rest state. So basically, so how many of you know what address states are? Uh, it's already a little more stuff. So uh, okay, so let me now you know talk a little bit. So what the rest states is is the problem. So let's first keep our kind of uh, consideration with this no two state system. So let's assume that it's coupled by uh, uh, by some kind of driving um, uh, field. In general, it will be coupled you know, with the field which are driving frequency and, and some detuning data. Right? So uh, basically, what will happen is that you know, populations kind of start moving around, you know, these levels, you know, they start acquiring phases, some complicated things. But oftentimes, <coughs> all of these kind of complicated dynamics could be greatly simplified if Instead of looking at uh, dynamics in this kind of bare basis, what you do, you basically um, find a new basis of the states, 
uh, the basis which is associated with the Hamiltonian of this two-state system, involving levels one and two, which is then coupled by light. Right? So this, you know, uh, this system will have a Hamiltonian, which is basically a pair Hamiltonian, plus a Hamiltonian interaction with light. And this kind of total Hamiltonian can be diagonalized. And so what you can do, you can basically find a new um, uh, pair of states. Uh, the pair of states, you know, sort of, you know, it's a two by two, it's two by two matrix, you know, which now with some of diagonal coupling, right? You can diagonalize it, find some new uh, eigenstates, you know, there will be two eigenstates. So one of them I can call plus, another I can call minus. And those uh, states will be in general uh, superpositions of. Theta has nothing to do with the previous speed. So in general, coherent superposition of, <coughs> of ground and excited state. And so what we see it is so this is zero. Each of you would use black or what? Black marker. It reflects back. I see. So I'll switch. So let me finish. So this is this is zero. Right, so these are basically you know, superpositions of the original states, right? So how about blue? Blue, blue, blue. Yeah, I like that. Um, and of course, what will happen is that basically also uh, so this new you know these two new eigenvectors of this two by two matrix will also have some eigenvalues, which will be basically energies of this dead state. Right, so uh, basically what, we'll, uh, what this means is that this you know, E, that there will be two um, eigenvalues with two dress state energies which one can write down like this story. So in particular, so uh, let's so let's consider one specific case, and the specific one specific case will be where delta is equal to zero, right? Where this field is of resonance, and uh, in this case we expect that the system will undergo radio oscillations, right? So how can one understand these radio oscillations in the dress state basis? So what uh, in this case? Uh, uh, what will be these states plus and minus in the case when the tuning is equal to zero? The original eigenstates. What? The original eigenstates. No. The tuning is equal to zero, <coughs> but the radius frequency is not equal to zero. So if I want to write down the Hamiltonian for the reference case in this kind of properly chosen rotating frame right, and stuff like that, the Hamiltonian will look like this. Okay. So what will be the eigenvectors of this Hamiltonian? Yes. Um, <coughs> the excited state splits up into two split states. And what happens with ground state? With ground state? Stay the same. Any other ideas? So let me write down, so let's, okay, let's slow down here, because you know, if, if we cannot go past that, then, then I think, you know, we have a problem. So, okay, so the Hamiltonian, <coughs> if they have an effective Hamiltonian in this case, uh, for this resonantly driven system, in a properly chosen frame of reference, looks like this, zero, one, It's the same thing what I wrote here. It's a matrix, so it's a Hamilton. The question is, what are the eigenstates? Eigenvectors of this Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, zero plus one and zero minus one. Exactly. Exactly. So this remember, so this is like, remember going back to your kind of elementary quantum mechanics, 
uh, remember, we generate perturbation theory, right? So if you have two states, which are completely to the same energy, right? When you apply some perturbation which mixes them up, right? You have to find new kind of good eigenstates. So this good eigenstates usually this, in this, you know, two-state case, just symmetric and anti-symmetric superposition. So it's precisely what we have. So basically, you could say, you know, wait a second. So these two levels to begin with were not really degenerate, right? But what happens here is once you start driving this transition, this time they're in field. And if this field matches the, uh, the field frequency matches the transition energy between these two states, right? Then if you make a transformation uh, uh, kind of in, in a frame, in a, in a sort of, if you make a transformation in a frame which, uh, where the phase of the atom kind of you know, basically rotates with the same frequency as a, as a phase of the field, then effectively this becomes, uh, this, this two states become degenerate. So basically you can, you can think sort of physically about it as this field which is oscillating, takes this level and kind of brings it up here, right? Because this field is time dependent. Right? Once you eliminate this time dependence, it sort of means that you, this basically the energy of this photon here brings this level right to this point up here, right? So then what happens is that you effectively end up with the system which has uh, two degenerate levels, Right? And once you have two degenerate levels, then the eigenstate uh, is just zero plus and minus one. Or square root of two. <coughs> now, what are the energies of these two states? Plus and minus one. What? H bar omega. Exactly. So this is because it's the only you know, scale we can have here, right, they will be split. E plus minus one will be plus minus h bar omega. Okay, now, in this kind of new basis, how can we understand the phenomenon of radio oscillations? So how can we understand this kind of cosine and sine oscillations without actually doing calculations? So initially, suppose we were in a state zero. <coughs> zero, our wave function is in a state zero. Right? So, but zero now, sorry, it's not plus. So, this zero now is no longer an eigenstate. These two guys are eigenstates. Right? So what I need to do, basically I need to Extend this zero in a kind of superposition of these two eigenstates, which will be basically in this case plus <coughs> plus minus. Right? So that's the initial state. So this is just plus plus minus with some coefficient. But now these two states have different energies, right? They have effective energies which differ by h omega. So what will happen is that if they start to wall, there will be a phase accumulated between these two fields, right? And this phase means that, you know, after some uh, period, which is on order of time period, on order of inverse omega, what will happen is the sign here will change from plus to minus, and plus minus minus is equal to one, right? So this phase accumulation between the rest states in the original basis correspond to atom moving back and forth between 0 and 1. Yeah. Any questions? So this is how one can understand the phenomenon of radio oscillations without solving anything, basically, right? without solving any differential equations. And at this point, you know, okay, we all know radio oscillations should happen, right? But, you know, once you start thinking about system which has a lot of levels, this, you know, believe me, this is very, very useful. This insight is very, very useful. So another one, another, another unique case, which is also worth considering, is the situation where delta is much larger than omega. 
So what will happen in this case? So what will happen when beta is much larger than omega? What will be the dynamics of the system? So it will no, we are no longer kind of random oscillations, right? So what will happen? What will happen if not? Suppose the atom is actually in the, in the ground state. What's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. There will be kind of there will be some kind of high frequency, kind of very low am am amplitude uh, 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 oscillations will will occur. And in addition, what will be another very important okay. exactly. So what will happen effectively is that. Uh, there will be also some kind of phase accumulated, you know, here, as, you know, associated with this uh, atom staying in the same system. So if we basically, if we neglect, if the amplitude of these radio stations is very, very small, we can basically neglect it, right? But if you look at, at the phase of this, of, this, um, uh, of this state, this phase will actually undergo some change. <coughs> at what rate? Omega squared over delta. Exactly. Omega squared over delta. So where does it come from? From energy. Exactly. So the best way to understand this, uh, this is in fact known as AC star shift. So the best way to understand this is to basically look at this energy, for example, and expand it. And what you find is that there will be two uh, so, so what, what you find is that in this case, basically, um, 